Hello again. This is Trina from Humble Homestead, my garden side chat. In this video, I am going to prepare these strawberries and get ready to make some fruit leather out of them. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm just chop off the grains, chop them up, blend them up in my blender. I know in some of the recipes that I saw, a lot of people put sugar in them, but I honestly try to stay away from anything white, like white flour, white sugar. So I'm going to try to taste them and see how they are. I am going to cook them. I saw somewhere you just kind of cook them for like 10 minutes over low heat. It helps the color of the fruit leather, it brings out a little bit of the sweetness. If I feel that they're a little tart, because um, I'm kind of going to be making them well for myself because I love strawberries and then Peyton and I are gonna make them so if I feel like they need some sweetener I have some raw honey I might throw a little raw honey in there I'm gonna start cutting these up and I thought what I would do is while I'm preparing this I would talk a little bit about my history I'm gonna do it in little doses because bringing up my history is a little bit uh, traumatizing but I do want to help some people and go over what I've overcome in my past health. And so um, today I just wanna talk a little bit about how it all started. Yeah, we'll start there. I was a really young mom. Um, I had my first son at 19, super healthy back then. I was always very active as a child. I always wanted to grow up and be a mom. That was just kind of my goal. I loved children. Always knew I was called to work with children. By the time I had my third son, I kind of was feeling like I should go back to school. When he was two, I started going back to school. I was going back to school to be a doctor. I'm going to kind of jump through and fast forward a little bit. In 1999, well before then, I was kind of having a lot of weird like chest pain. You know, things that I was having headaches, which I never had headaches in my entire life. So I would go to the doctor and headaches, I mean, you know, it's really hard, hard to diagnose a headache. So I don't know, they just give me medication and say, you know, let's see if it goes away. For the chest pain, they would look at me and they would say, it's costa chondritis. You know, you're in your 20s, you're thin, you're healthy. Costa chondritis is inflammation of a chest wall. So I had had like some bronchitis or pneumonia and if you cough too hard, you can, it's basically like spraining your chest so that's pretty much what they told me I had but it, it never went away and they said well you know it can take months and months to heal yada 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 so I kept going I was going to school and fast forward to you know I had a full load I had three kids I was going to school full time still babysat for some of the professional football players you know occasionally and I was really active in my church and then all of a sudden I remember like I'd go to class and I'd go home and I'd just like go to sleep. I couldn't do anything else. All I could do was sleep. But I knew I had to go to school because I, it was so competitive. I had to have a 4.0, I had to, you know, I mean I went to the University of Minnesota. So if you realize what it was like that, it was, it was just so competitive. So anyway. All of a sudden, I remember being in Target. Oh, well first, I like I had really bad chest pain. I could barely walk to my car, and I went to the emergency room. And they told me, oh, you know what, you're just having an anxiety attack. And I'm like, listen, my degree's in psychology, and I study panic disorder, and I will tell you with 100% certainty that is not what's going on. But, you know, that's what they discharged me with. So, you know, I just am not gonna argue with the doctor. I went home, and I had a friend who was a nurse, and I was at Target, and I remember my heart was just racing, but I just went home and I went to bed, and she's like, you have got to go to the ER. And I'm like, I am not going. I mean, all they're gonna do is tell me I have anxiety. So she was really insistent, and she brought me there. And I remember being on the telemetry, which is kind of like the heart monitors, or they are, it is a heart monitors. And I stood up to go to the bathroom. And you know, they had done EKGs and stuff, nothing, they found nothing. But I stood up to go to the heart, the bathroom, and my heart rate shot to 200. Just like, boom, it just shot right up. And they all came rushing in, and they're like, okay, that is not normal. And I'm like, right? So then the, the one doctor, they, they called the cardiologist down, and he just thought, just for kicker's sake, let's do an EKG with you standing up and see what happens. 
So then they saw something. They're like, yeah, this is not right. So they admitted me and the cardiologist there was great. I mean, he was, he just happened to do a study on POTS, which is posture orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And he, which is so weird because nobody really knew what this was. And he said, he looked at me and he said, I want you to know, I don't think you're crazy. We are going to figure this out. And I just lost it because all of these, I mean, I went four years undiagnosed. So they ended up doing an echocardiogram and my heart was, it had an infraction of 30%, which basically meant my heart was operating at 30%. So all these years, I literally was in heart failure. And it was just basically because nobody had caught it. He said, well, you know what, let's do an EP study, which is to look at your heart and see if there's like a nerve, all the nerves in your heart and look and see if there's a nerve they can a nerve they can ablate like they can kill that nerve and then maybe it will fix it so i'm like okay well whatever you know so they went in and during the ep study i v-fibbed which basically it's almost like flat line but it's really just quivering i v-fibbed and so they had to shock me back to life and then i remember laying there and they're like okay honey we're gonna let you pass out again because it, it hurts when they when they shock you back it I am I am not sugarcoating it it hurts so I'm like no 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 I don't want to do that again the second time I know I get this question a lot and I, I'm just gonna be frank with you because um people are like did you see God did you see the white light and you know I no no I did not but I do know the second time I remember being very far away like I was far away and I know distinctively, sorry for that, I know that the choice was mine whether I could continue and leave this earth or whether I could come back. And I remember I thought of my three boys. I knew that I needed to come back for them. If it wasn't for them, honestly, I don't know that I would have. Some days I think, well, should I have? I mean, honestly, yeah, I know that's silly. I mean, I, but, but honestly, through all those years of what I went through, oh, it was a struggle. But then at that point, I had to fight. I remember fighting, like it was like, like I, I remember feeling like a slow-mo like run. You know, I know that sounds, it's so weird. It's like, I don't know how to even explain it. But I remember, and then all of a sudden I hear the doctors and nurses calling my name and it was like, it was far away and I was trying to get to them, trying, and then all of a sudden I, I felt, Kajung! I felt it. I was like, oh no, 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 Kajung! And they shocked me back to life. So that is kind of, that's my come back to life story at that time. I, I've had several other ones, but, but that's the one that I had that time. Yeah, so that's kind of how that started and then they kind of told me well guess what you're, you're gonna need a pacemaker defibrillator because this could happen at, you could be walking down the street and this could happen we don't know so I remember God, I, I just felt so awful and I remember being in the hospital and I knew I had finals coming up and I was studying for finals and the doctor came in and he said we don't really think you understand what we're talking about right now you have got to make a decision here. You've got to pull back. You've got to slow down. And I remember just sobbing. I'm not giving up. You don't know what it took for me to get here. I don't, you know, there's like 3,000 applicants and 160 openings to get into medical school at the University of Minnesota. And I got there. I made it. And I'm not quitting. <laughs> and so I was like, I had my big old, you know, meltdown and it was it was just yeah it was a mess but stop right there with this part of the story i ended up getting a pacemaker defibrillator i ended up having to drop out of school that is really the reason why i'm focusing on health and wellness because it took me years and years and years to get to where i am today and my motto is really it's just not that serious you know, it's not. Whatever you're going through, I know it might seem like the world is ending, but it's not that serious. There's just so much more out there. I really want to live simply now. I have 
had friends that are A-lister celebrities in LA, movie stars. And the interesting thing is that the, the more, most times that they called me is when they were in crisis. When they were, lives were perfect, I didn't hear from them. I've had people who've had multi-million dollar contracts that had to file bankruptcy. These, these young kids that are NFL stars and they have these multi-million dollar contracts and they're like worship from the time they're children. They don't have mentors and they're not taught how to behave as real, real grown-ups. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how else to put it. I've seen the drugs, I've seen the alcohol, I've seen the women, I've seen just to me, it breaks my heart because what do they have now to show for it? Do you know what I mean? It's like some of these people who have lost their careers to injuries or they don't have the money that they're used to then they start doing illegal things to make money i mean cash money under the table it's not the kind of life that's worth living it's not what really brings true happiness that's why living humbly and living off what's sustainable and what god give us i mean it, there's nothing like watching your stuff grow you know there is just nothing like it it's like wow i grew this this is like Picking something out of your garden and bringing and chopping it up and having it for dinner, that's exciting. That's joy, you know? So I'm gonna stop there with my, with my story. I'm actually gonna blend these up and then I will uh, put them in the little cooker, on the little stove top, and then I'll show you how I spread them out to do the fruit leather. So yeah, thanks for listening. Okay, so back with the fruit leather. I just cooked this for like 10 minutes over this in a saucepan over the stove. Now I do have these little rubber mats here, but I everyone is telling me to put parchment paper down. So I'm gonna, but then they say like halfway through, take the parchment paper off. I don't know. I'm gonna see. Well, let's try. I'm gonna pour this one. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, I remembered when I lived in Minneapolis. <laughs> Many of you remember too because I don't know. Many miles away you somehow smelled it or knew I was making it because everyone would show up at my door. But I used to make this triberry jam. I did have some blueberries and I did have some raspberries and I thought oh, I'm gonna do it. I, so I did. I made triberry uh, for the fruit leather. And let me tell you, it tastes almost exactly like that jam I used to make. So I'm super excited to see how this turns out. So I'm just gonna pour some here, spread it out. I don't know how thin we go. I don't think it has to be like super thin because it's pureed. So that's one it's there. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I was gonna tell you while that was cooking, I had got this bag of organic honey crisp apples and then I got a few um, Granny Smith. So I just did one Granny Smith and some honey crisp. I just, uh, I uh, used my mandolin and sliced them up and put them in lemon water. And then I coated them in cinnamon. That's why they're brown. And I'm gonna put them in my dehydrator and make apple chips. So I thought that would be a good snack too. This is also, but this is so good because my grandma used to do this with jam. But when I made this triberry, if you have some extra hot, I don't have any because I don't really eat ice cream, but if you have vanilla ice cream, this is amazing over vanilla ice cream. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I think I'm gonna put these in my dehydrator, but I'm gonna, the apples, I'm just gonna put these out um, like this. So let's see, can I tell you a little bit more about my history? I got the defibrillator with uh, pacemaker implanted, left medical school. It really did help my cardiac symptoms. Ended up taking some medication that keeps my heart rate down. The one thing though that wasn't really known is there was an autoimmune side to POTS. And that was the chronic nausea, chronic migraines, and chronic fatigue. And I tell you, those doctors back then, and no fault of their own, they just weren't educated and they just didn't know. They made me feel like it was all in my head. I mean, every time they're like, we have no medical reason for your nausea and vomiting. And it was so frustrating 
because they made me feel like I was crazy, which made, you know, part some people in my family may, maybe thought I was crazy too. But you know, you just, when you're nonstop vomiting and you're, you know, you're having these migraines, there's nothing you can do. And it was just, it was awful. So I ended up finding one neurologist. I mean, I went from neurologist to neurologist and, and because of my heart stuff, I couldn't have any migraine medicines because of my heart stuff at the time. But I, and I was very reactive to um, anti-nausea. So I was just a hot mess. A friend of mine told me about this neurologist and how compassionate she was and how she was going to help me. And, you know, the thing is, is that I really was anti-narcotic pain medication. So the first thing I said to her was, I don't want to take any pain medication. She was an osteopath. So I thought, oh, great. She was going to, you know, adjust me, do it more natural. So I went to her and that was the first thing I said to her. Well, after the, like the second visit, she adjusted me first. Second visit, you know, and I was just sicker than a dog. She, I don't know where that statement comes from. Dogs aren't always sick. Sorry, puppies. But anyway, she convinced me, like she had this whole speech prepared. You know, you got to hit it, the, hit the pain at the onset and you got to treat it. And if you treat it at the onset, you know, with the medication, then it goes away right away. And then you don't have to. So, I mean, she had con she had me hook, line and sinker. Then I went on pain medication and it was, it was just a mess. It was years to, I mean, I knew in my spirit and in my heart that that wasn't right. But, you know, try to explain, you know, to the doctors. I mean, you know, she, she was like the word, you know. So, so I went through a big battle with that and getting off the medications. I mean, it was, it was so bad that I was actually in the hospital one day. And I mean, I had over 200 hospital stays, you guys, in two years. I mean, it was, it was horrifying. I hated hospitals. I hated doctors. My cardiologist was fabulous. This doctor, which I'm not going to name, she literally like took over all of my care. She would, um, I would be having heart symptoms and she would put me on the neuro floor. And because I would keep telling her, I don't want to take these medicines anymore. I, I want to stop them. I don't want to take them. And she just, she wouldn't listen to me. I, I still, I look back and I don't understand the reason of this. I mean, if a patient doesn't want to take medication, why are you giving them to them? But anyway, I, I don't know. I'm not, God bless her. But I, I remember one time I just decided I am not going to take them anymore. I have asked her several times to stop and she, she wouldn't. Um, I would, I would get sick and she'd be like, see, your body needs them. Your body needs them. And one day I just made the decision I'm not taking them. And I had, I mean, she had me on IV medication. It was not like, it was not like, you know, light little stuff. So I decided I was going to stop. And I remember at home, I went cold turkey. I got so sick. I was laying on the floor. I mean, I was, and I ended up getting going in the hospital. And um, she got so mad. I remember she was like, F you and F this and screaming at me. And she literally, I mean, I remember my kidneys were shutting down. She stopped all IV access, everything. And I just didn't understand. Because at that point, when I went to the hospital, I had blood clots. Oh, that's right. I had blood clots. And when they looked at my chart in the ER, they instantly put me back on this medication because that's what she had had in my chart. And I'm like, no. So then I was like, listen, they put me on this medication. Please, I want to wean off it. I can't go through that again. And then she came back and she just blew up and, and she, and then she stopped everything. She like stopped all IV access, everything. And so at that point I just determined she's just trying to let me die. So I couldn't get a hold of, I didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, my family was believing her. So at that point I just didn't, I mean, I, I called my cardiologist. Cause all of a sudden I, it hit me. I'm like, if I have blood clots and I'm a cardiac patient, why am I on the neural floor. So I called my cardiologist and I said to him, this is what's going on. I mean, very briefly, and I'm here. And the next day he came in and he looked at me and he said, I am so sorry. Nobody told me you were here. And I, then at that point, I just like lost it. And I told him exactly what was happening. And he literally, I mean, I, I hadn't been eating. I had no fluids. I was like so close to death's door. He literally 
put an NG tube down, gave me fluids, and he had me out of, I said, I have to get out of here. I can't be in this hospital anymore. I'm, you know, and he had me out of there in 24 hours. And that, I, I always, and he knows, he knows because I thought he's retired now, but I had so many conversations with me. I'm like, this doctor saved my life. <laughs> you have no idea. And, and he, he, there is a couple doctors that I'm really close to. And, and I don't name her because, but they, we all know because we're, I don't, I honestly don't even know how she has a medical license anymore. But I'm like, that doctor that almost killed me, or like my neurologist in, in the cities, he was on the board of medical school when I was there. So, and he works at the same clinic she does. So he just, he, I mean, he would just tell me stories of stuff that would go on with her. And I'm like, I don't get it. You know, it's really difficult to, I, it's really difficult to find fault in a doctor. It, it is really hard to do that. So that's my biggest thing is, is, I guess my point in all this is, you really have to take your own, you know, your own medical records. You have to be your own advocate. I had to be my own advocate, but it took me years to figure that out because I trusted my doctor. I trusted her. We almost were friends. We talked shop all the time. But I, you know, when I knew something was wrong, I mean, I, I mean, I had that standard before I even went to her. I don't know. Today, when I moved out here, I was so scared. Like, I was so scared to even have to find a new doctor. But I researched. I mean, I researched the doctor. I mean, I made sure my doctor was really big in preventative medicine. She is an osteopath. The first thing I asked her was, what are your thoughts on pain medication? Because I don't take them. I, I don't. I just, I don't believe in them. I had a really bad experience with them. I made sure, and she, she's all for that. She's really big and preventative. She's happy that I'm growing herbs. So yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy that I found a doctor that um, supports the lifestyle that I want to live. So anyway, so that's my biggest takeaway from this is, you know, Yes, you know, we do have to use doctors. I mean, I do. I still have heart medication. Oh my gosh, the deer, you guys, I love them. Sorry, I got distracted. But, um, you know, just be your own advocate. Do your research. Live as healthy as you can. Um, you know, I did a lot of pool therapy, physical therapy, things like that for years. I'll talk about more of that later. But right now, I'm going to put these apples and this fruit leather in the dehydrator, and then I will show you the final product tomorrow because it takes 12 hours. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If I help one person, I will feel like I'm doing my job. If you guys have any questions, just leave them below. I'll do my best to answer them. All right, thanks, you guys. Have a great day, and be blessed. Okay, hi. So I just wanted to show you the finished product of the apple chips and the fruit roll-ups, fruit leather I did. So these are the apple chips. They're pretty crunchy. I like to eat them just as is. I munched on a little bit today. So what I do is I just put them in my jars like this and I will seal them up and they last for years. I mean, years and years. So you can, I, I put cinnamon on them. You can have them. I'm just going to use them as snacks, just like this. And I'll just seal them up. Have them as snacks if you want. I know people do apple slices and just use them for baking. Like they make big um, apple pie. So for the fruit leather, I just take a pizza cutter. And I'll just cut a strip here like this. My grandson's like two, so... Um, I think this is a good size for him. And then I take some parchment paper and I just put it to the side and I just cut a piece of parchment paper like this and I roll it up. Roll it up in the parchment paper like this, literally like a fruit roll up. So they're um, individual. And then what I do is I just take a piece of tape. 
um, I, I'm just using masking tape and I just close it like this so that it stays sealed and then I put them in my jars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that with all of these. Yeah, so I'll fill this up. Then I will seal that up with, if you watch the video on how to seal it, I um, use the, and maybe even do some more apples and fill it up. And yeah, and then I just seal it and they're good for years, but you know, I'm sure they won't last that long. So yeah, that's all. And uh, please subscribe and share. Thanks for watching. That's the finished product. Have a great night. Bye.